Hello, party people, and welcome to office hours in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. I'm uh, flying back to San Diego tomorrow morning, and I just realized, I'm like, oh, I haven't recorded an office hours in uh, probably like a week now. My father flew down for Christmas, uh, and uh, we spent Christmas down here and New Year's Eve. Um, so now it's time to go back up and take care of some business stuff up in San Diego. But first, let's give you all a little uh, sun, sunrise view. It's uh, 745 in the morning here. So the top voted question off of Poll Gab uh, comes from At Home with COVID, who asks, historical advice is to spread multiple data files and file groups across disks. Well, so hold on, even before I go to the rest of your question, I'm going to stop and hit you right there. There were certain circumstances where that made sense. And the general rule that I give people is either at a terabyte of size on a server, if you're talking about like a terabyte of data size on one server, then it starts to make sense to explore those options or where you're hitting storage bottlenecks, specifically around page I.O. latch, uh, and that the, you've determined that the best way to fix that is to spread data files across disks. But that's usually a last resort because it's so much work. Um, it says, now storage is allocated from balanced SAN as one drive, like the D drive for data and the L drive for logs. Are there any gains in having multiple data files and file groups in this scenario, ignoring temp files for obvious reasons? If you have one SAN and it's only got one volume, there probably aren't a lot of reasons to spread across multiple files and file groups. But what I would push back on is when you hit the one terabyte mark, often you do need to sit down with your SAN administrator or if you're up in the cloud, you need to sit down with your systems administrators because there can be limits as to how much throughput you can get through one storage adapter in the cases of SANs especially when you're running under virtualization, uh, or in the cloud if you have uh, uh, each individual volume from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, there are often IOPS and throughput limits for each volume. So that you just got to be careful there. Um, the, but again, the, the time when I would even consider this is when you start to hit one terabyte or larger on a server, then it starts to make sense. There are edge case scenarios where you need to drag a lot of data off of disk Usually the way that I fix that is just by adding memory. If we're talking about a 100 gig database uh, where people are constantly scanning tables, go fix the indexes and tune the mem and uh, uh, fix the memory and then that's usually a better fix. And then trying to redo the database across multiple volumes and make sure that they have different paths across each of the volumes and all that stuff. It's a big pain in the rear. Next question is from Darius who asks, Hi Brent, in what kind of scenario would you recommend a table to have a non-clustered primary key and then a clustered non-unique index on another set of columns? What would be the physical organization of such a table and what type of queries would benefit from it? For that, check out in the Mastering Index Tuning class, the module on how to design clustered indexes. And in there, we talk about the logical database design, physical database design for how you pick clustered indexes and primary keys. We also talk in the, along in that same lines, look at the foreign keys module in Mastering Index Tuning, um, where we discuss it in there as well. I wish I could give you a 30 second answer, but unfortunately it's one of those reasons why I have to have full-blown mastering classes because that one's pretty complex. Next up, SQL Mile asks, Hi Brent, according to you, what are the best monitoring solutions that can be used for at the same time for cloud VMs, Azure SQL, Amazon RDS, and on-premises? Um, so I don't like usually using, having one perfect pane of glass to monitor everything including both Azure SQL DB and conventional VMs. Um, the, the monitoring tools that you'll find tend to be when you get into the kind of company that's having to monitor stuff across all that whole breadth from Azure SQL DB to VMs to VMs on premises, um, usually they aim for something really cheap that monitors everything. And it does a crappy job across the board, uh, but it just hits the lowest common denominator. 
Um, uh, I don't know of a really good tool that does a good job across all of those. Next up, uh, Wally says, Hi Brent, I'm planning on migrating from SQL Server 2014 to SQL Server 2019, but keeping Compat Level 2014 after the move. Do we still need to run Microsoft's Migration Assistant on the 2014 server to spot any potential migration issues? So the Migration assist Assistant does other things too, and I can't remember off the top of my head what they are, I applaud you for even thinking of running it because most people don't even think to run it or don't have the time. The thing that I'm more worried about is using something in the code that has been outright or just outright no longer available. And I'm going to use the example, and I don't know when it was deprecated. I don't know what year they yanked the support from it. Uh, but there used to be an option to back up the log file to null. Is that right? Back up to an empty store, back up with truncate only. There was some kind of thing that we used to be able to do. That's terrible that I don't remember this, but it's been a problem. The thing that makes me worry is you jump 2014 to 2019. And I haven't done any migrations from 2014 to 2019 in years. Um, there used to be some kind of thing that we could do with a backup to the transaction log, and that simply is no longer available uh, with uh, 2019. You sh and it might have been 2017 or 2016 when they yanked it. You never should have been doing it to begin with. It was a bad idea, but of course people make their livings doing bad ideas. Um, so those, those would be the kinds of things that I would hope Migration Assistant would catch. I just don't know of a lot of people who use it, but I'm glad that you do. So it's a good question. Uh, let me rephrase that too. So when you, when, what would I do if I'm trying to spot potential migration issues? The first thing that I do is I'll run SP Blitz and use it with the check server info equals one parameter. Check server info equals one. It lists things like trace flags, non-default server level settings, some linked servers. I'm looking for things that could be left behind when you move from 2014 to 2019. That's the bigger concern that I have, is that people forget that they have some wacko, obscure ODBC driver or something like that. Next up, Doug says, Hello, Brent. SP Blitz backup shows that it would take around 24 hours to restore our large multi-terabyte database full backup. Do you have any tips for reducing the restore time, i.e. switching to third-party backup software, etc.? Yes, two things. Number one, if you're already on multi-terabyte, I can't recommend strongly enough that you should be checking out SAN snapshot backups. SAN snapshot backups are magical because they help get the first part of the backup done very quickly, like getting it outside of the SQL server. And then you can use different kinds of technology to get that snapshot elsewhere, like replicate it, offload it to a virtual tape library, and so forth without slowing down the SQL server if it's architected correctly. So check in with your SAN administrator and see if you've got the ability to do SAN snapshot backups. Second is to try to stripe your backups across multiple data files, multiple backup files. If you write your full backup to say four backup files striped simultaneously instead of one, and this is built in support with native backups as well, Ola Hollingren scripts support it. If you back up to four data files, generally, all other things being equal, you can get four times faster throughput. Now, this does affect or does depend on your ability to write to the backup targets quickly enough. Generally speaking, you'll find that SQL Server's own internal implementations around single file backups um, are the bigger bottleneck there. But then the next level of tuning is that you put those four backup files on the fastest storage possible on a different server that's connected via at least 10 gig ethernet, if not teamed 10 gig ethernet uh, cables. Uh, but that's usually the, the problem that I run into is people are trying to back up over a crowded network pipe. Uh, they're not using teaming of the network adapters and then the backup target on the other end is often really inexpensive storage uh, because the company was like, well, it's just backup storage. It doesn't need to be fast. Well, if you want to write your backups as quickly as possible, it kind of does. Next up, uh, Corit asks, Hi Brent, what are your best practices for SQL data compression? 
Industry advice once was that fewer data pages saved IOs and meant more pages cached in RAM. Are those benefits still compelling in the days of SSDs and hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, or are the delete, update, and insert impacts too great? For me, and this is just for me, and this is my own experience, and I know other people have had other experiences than this. I have never had a situation where I looked at a client server and said, all we have to do is implement compression at the table level, at the index level, and we're gonna be good. Like that's never been the one thing that got us across the finish line. It can be part of an overall picture, but just to give you an example, usually it's easier to go through and drop a bunch of redundant indexes that were lying around, or just ask simple questions about why are these tables so large? You know, do we have years of data in here that we've never archived? What's this click log table with 100 gigs worth of data in it that nobody ever queries? Um, those are usually a faster, easier bang for the buck for me instead of rewriting indexes, because whenever you turn on compression, uh, you're going to rewrite the entire index. Having said that, even though it's never been the one thing that's got me across the finish line, I have also never, not even once, had to tell a client, I need you to turn off compression in order to solve a problem. Again, other uh, people that I've uh, talked to have had that exact problem where they've said, oh, you know, because of our rates of deletes and updates and inserts, like 10,000 a second, compression had too high of an overhead. And I'm like, well, yeah, but if, you, you know, if you're dealing 10,000 inserts, deletes, uh, updates per second on the same table, you probably have other problems too, but uh, like the number of indexes. But I, I, I don't think that it's uh, ever compression has been a thing that got me across the finish line. Now... When I do want compression these days, what I want is column store indexes instead. Column store has a much better compression ratio uh, than plain old data compression, uh, like page and row compression. Column store has a phenomenal, like 70, 80, 90 percent compression ratio under the right circumstances. Plus, it introduces all kinds of other cool improvements to your execution plans as well. Next up, Mojito DBA asks, an app with implicit transactions causes huge version store and TempDB is still growing due to sleeping transactions. Oracle isn't an option because we're waiting to become self-managed and ask it to come with a wine tap at that price. Is it a good idea to kill sleeping transactions over, than an, over an hour long? My, my concern there is, uh, I would worry that someone is doing a legit transaction, like a deployment. I know it sounds crazy, but I've seen people, especially like third-party vendor code, try to do begin tran and then make all kinds of changes and then uh, check to see something and either commit or roll back. So you're real nervous if you don't control the code killing other people's transactions because a rollback can be single-threaded, can take days, can get kind of ugly. If you do control the code, then go start fixing the problems with implicit transactions being left open. But I, I just get so nervous about killing queries that we don't control, especially when no one else is around. If uh, two terabytes for TempDB isn't catastrophic, my laptop has a four terabyte PCIe uh, solid state NVMe drive. So sometimes it helps to reset perspective. If you can go buy on Amazon a $200 drive that, that holds your entire TempDB, it's not really all that large, you know, relatively speaking. I know it seems large to you and I, but just be careful because the fix can be worse than the disease. Um, what I would consider in your scenario is if you want to check on a manual basis at the beginning and end of every workday, maybe while there's a human being around and you can go through the queries and the open transactions, see which locks they hold. But that's something that I, I just wouldn't automate killing. Next, especially when you say that the transactions are that large. Uh, next up, uh, Mehdi asks, in the Stack Overflow database, how many indexes are there in the users table? Well, the, the, keep in mind that there are, uh, there's the public data export, that comes with only the clustered index and no non-clustered indexes. 
There's the training copy of the Stack Overflow database, the one that I use for my mastering classes. I don't remember offhand, but I want to say that I ship it with like six or eight indexes on the user's table, and they're purposely bad to help people understand index tuning when we do the mastering classes. And then there's the public Stack Overflow data, or the actual Stack Overflow database. I haven't touched Stack Overflow's production database in years. Um, so that would be the kind of question that I, if you want to ask, go ask folks who currently work for Stack Overflow. Yeah, the, the thing that I would caution you is don't try to take what Stack Overflow does and apply it to your own environments because Stack Overflow is a very different animal. It's one of the world's 50 biggest websites. Um, they have all local solid state, if I remember right, all local solid state still for the databases. They're using ACE and always on availability groups. I mean, they do all kinds of things differently than you might do with your production databases and it would affect index design as well. And then we'll do one more. Uh, George says, hello, Brent. Will you show your pro, share your pros and cons of being a DBA versus being a developer? Oh, oh, oh. Um, database administrators, the pros are there can be a higher salary headroom. Like you can make more money as a, uh, all things equal, a DBA with a certain amount of experience and a developer with a certain amount of experience. You can usually make more money as a database administrator. Um, and there are cases where you can make more money as a developer if you're on really hot technology, whatever. But generally, it's easier to get more money as a database administrator. Um, you are more connected to more people in the company. It feels like you're more of a central hub because you know everything that's going on with the data. You have access to more systems teams if you're into that kind of thing. Um, Drawbacks with it uh, are you're on call 24-7, usually you're part of an on-call rotation or you are the on-call rotation, um, and you're always at the mercy of someone else who shipped something without thinking it through. You know, DBA, default blame acceptor, you're the one who has to answer the call in the middle of the night about why the uh, transaction log is full, for example. Developers, uh, the pros of being developers are you get to actually build things and see them in people's hands. I, I think uh, not enough people understand how cool that is until you ship something and you see the public using it or your employees using it and they thank you for the job that gets done. People rarely think thank DBAs for their work. People think that if a DBA is doing everything perfectly, then they shouldn't get any phone calls. Um, so the developer, you have this tangible end result at the end of your day. At the end of your day, you can clock out. And in many cases, you're not on the on-call rotation. There are some cases where you are. There are some shops where the developers still have to be on call for things, but they're not on call nearly as often as the database administrators are on call. They can kind of leave their work and check out and go home for the day. All right, speaking of checking out and going home for the day, it is time for breakfast. I'm at, uh, one of the things I love about being down here, I bought a condo down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, um, that's in a very like Airbnb friendly kind of area. So a lot of the uh, uh, condo owners rent their places out for Airbnb. Um, so there's a restaurant here on premises. There's a little Palapa bar. And so I go down there every morning and go get breakfast and uh, probably a Bloody Mary or a margarita. Um, and then uh, what am I doing after that? Oh, we have, a, we have our COVID test uh, today at 1230. Uh, so right after breakfast, we'll probably come down to the pool here and uh, go veg out. So thanks a lot for hanging out with me today, and I will see y'all in the next Office Hours, which will probably be uh, back up at my place in San Diego. So see you in a while. <laughs>